On to Moscow is a game in the book game line by Worthington Games and as the game says the, these games come in the books in the format of a book and you are supposed to be right things on each map so each map you play it once and then you go to the next page you go to the next map and there is so basically they are roll and ride war games which is an interesting new concept and I'm never gonna do that, I'm never gonna actually write on these box. Uh, the early games in the system were just making photocopies. Uh, now this recent batch came with a transparent sheet of plastic, so I place it there and I write on each map with the dry erase marker. I wish the sheet of paper or the sheet of plastic came was a little bigger, maybe I'll just get a bigger one because then I could stick it right in there and for like really stick it in there and forget about it. But if I do that, it just doesn't cover everything or it just covers it barely. Still, that's a new way of, that's a different way of playing uh, the game, which I like very much. On to Moscow, we are in Barbarossa, the game pl places the player in the position of the, of the Germans attacking, attacking the Soviet Union and that's, and that's the idea, you'll have a lot to do, trust me, uh, you're trying to take control of different cities on the board and uh, some cities have more value than others, of course Moscow or Sevastopol or Leningrad are more, are more valuable, but in any case every Russian city you control is worth a number of points. What is interesting is also you have an, inter, an interconnection, a synergy between what happens here, which is the main thing, with other theaters such as the Middle East, and North Africa, the Arctic Theater and even Great Britain. So, as you are spending actions to advance on these tracks, there are, and the enemy AI will create different negative effects for you, what the enemy AI also does is to place units in these theaters and basically they will drain your resources because at the end of the game, if they have more units than you in those theaters, you will lose points. So you're trying to balance the main show, which is still this one, with, uh, with diverting resources to the sideshows so that you don't lose too many points in the long run. This is definitely more complex than other games in the system, such as Gettysburg Solitaire or Waterloo Solitaire. It's similar to Bismarck, and, but it has just a nice, uh, a nice variety. The scenarios do play different from one another. First, because in different parts, uh, of the book, different maps represent different levels of strength of the enemy, so you will see different numbers on the board, at least in some sections. And also, you have different scenarios. Basically, uh, if you're a prisoner of conquered Ukraine, you will have the objective of taking control of a lot of areas in the south. If you fail to complete that objective, then you lose points. But there are different other scenarios such as finish revenge or destroy Leningrad or drive on Moscow or balance attack. So what you have is a variety of different missions and each of them also has different levels of difficulty. So really nice really nice variety here within a general system. Now, at the beginning, uh, the general structure is still similar to what you have in other book games, which is first you commit to your actions for the turn, then you resolve what the enemies do based on their AI, and then you finally get to complete your actions. But here you have more actions that you can do compared to say Gettysburg or Waterloo. And the opponents also, as we said, they have different things that they can do. So first during a turn, you will roll a die to determine how many resource points you receive. And you can receive one, two, four. And you write down how many you got for that turn. Then you commit to those. Now you can commit them to uh, bring reinforcements to, to re reserves to the various fronts. These outlines here represent reserves that you may have, you can send there, but you don't have yet. So I can spend a resource point to draw a circle around one of them and that makes that, uh, that reserve available. So I spend my first resource point doing that and I spend another resource point sending reserves to the central front 
and then I write a one here to indicate I'm spending one of my turn one resource points there and then I'm writing a one there so basically I'm committing to an advance on the northern front and advance on the southern front and I sent a, res a reserve there and a reserve there what you can do with those resource points basically is by writing numbers in these boxes you commit to advance or I should say attempt to <laughs> attempt to advance if you place a number there you're attempting to reduce the forces of Great Britain Again, you can spend a resource point to, to uh, create reserves and you can also, if you write a number there indicating the current turn and indicating our center resource there, it means you're adding a unit to one of those theaters or you are conducting a theater battle. And so, for example, next turn, again, suppose I, I have four resource points and then this time I want to try and advance on the Finnish front and advance on the central front. I send a resource there and I decide to send somebody to the Middle East. Again, the idea is when you circle a unit, you make it available. And so in this case, it represents the people are there. And if later they're killed in battle, then I draw a line through it. I cross it out to indicate that it's gone. Same thing to circle, to place a circle around a reserve, it means it's ready and when I want to use it, or a game if I destroys it, then I cross it out. So, that's how I'm planning my turn, and again, another thing that is important is, you know, again, I write a two there and a two there, because that indicates that I'm committing to those things. Then I resolve the AI, and it's really nice because sometimes I go back and I'm like, wait, what did I, after I resolve the AI action, so I'm like, wait, what, what did I commit to do? And then I simply go through all the displays and when I see the number for the current, turn, oh, that's where I was gonna dance. A couple of things though. Uh, if I have to write a number, so committing a resource point to a red box, that's all I do. Meaning if I place a number in a white box, box or a blue box that means when it's time to resolve my actions I will resolve it the red boxes indicate uh, refitting so I'm just taking my time then to refit however very often after the refit there is a blue box which means when I attend my action from a blue box instead of a white one I get a bonus when I roll the die so I commit to my actions again sending people to the side shows placing reserves or committing to advance or to attempt to advance on my main front. Then I roll two dice, they need to be a different color and I need to decide in my head which one I read first and which one I read second and depending on that I will resolve the actions of the AI. You can simply pause and, and read these effects and so you get a sense of what they can do, pretty self-explanatory but again different scenarios the AI will do different things. And then finally I get to uh, attempt to advance or perform my actions. When I attempt to advance, I simply look at the next city indicated by a number on the front when I'm trying to advance. Suppose I'm trying to advance on the northern front, then it's early on in the game, that's what I got there. I roll a die, apply modifiers, and I need to roll higher than that number in order to be able to take control of that area. I think that's how it works. That's that's definitely how I played it. I don't remember, maybe I missed that, I don't remember the rules explicitly saying that, that you need to roll higher in order to succeed, but then the example of play, it looks that way. And again, if I played it wrong, I like my variant, that's how it is. So, if I roll higher than two after modifiers are said and done, then from where I was, I took control of that city and I simply colored that in. Next time I try to advance, in this case, I may have a choice. I can try to go that way or that way with different numbers to, to attack. Remember those reserves. If I commit a reserve when I am attacking, I cross it out and I get plus one modifier. Again, if uh, the operation, the resource point for that operation is in a blue box, I get a plus one. And there are other things that may give me negative modifiers. Again, other things will be, remember, you're trying to have more people in the other theaters than, than, they, have, than they have people uh, from time to time. That's why I want to thin them out. I'm going to roll dice and try to launch an attack against them to remove their units. Other times, based on what the AI does, they will attack, they will attack there. 
And again, I can choose to spend points in Great Britain to roll a die. If I see that they are piling up airplanes there, then I'm going to roll a, a spend a resource point to roll a die there and try to remove the units from there. So I will continue like this until the end of turn 20. Then I will score positive points based on, on, on my objectives, on the cities I took control of. Again, not all cities on the map are born equal, some are more valuable. I score all my points. I check if I lose points for not having, for, for being outnumbered in the side theaters. I check to see if I lost points based on the missions for that for that scenario, and then I see my final score, and based on that, I know how well or poorly I did, and on to Moscow. As of now, on to Moscow Solitaire is the crowning jewel of the book game line by, uh, by Worthington Games. It is definitely a lot more interesting, a lot more decisions, a lot more gameplay than the tactical games, such as Gettysburg Solitaire or Waterloo Solitaire. And to me, it's also more interesting, more fascinating than Bismarck, which I still like a lot. Uh, but that one has, uh, well, uh, still has more of a tactical slash operational feel. You still have one unit surrounded by possible enemies that can come out of nowhere. And there can be some major reversal of fortune there at the last turn. You just get sunk at the last, the last turn. That happens. On to Moscow has a really cool, really interesting architecture. So there is randomness there, but I like the fact that overall you're going to feel there's going to be a curve because there's going to be randomness on so many turns so that sometimes you get four, sometimes you get one resource point. And it's going to be unlikely that you're going to get only one resource point or only or, or four resource points every, every time that you play. So you find that that randomness feels to be more evenly distributed across the game because there are just so many instances of small little uh, events influenced by by um, by luck. So and again, it's not it's not that one attack, that one thing that is going to destroy you. Uh, sure, you're going to try to attack Moscow and your lawn and you're spending your reserves and using everything that you can, and you got that one chance. Sure, but. There are still so many other things that you can do to score points. There's so many other things that you should do to avoid uh, to avoid losing points. So that's why that you feel that overall there is indeed this balance of a large event with so many things to take into account from time to time punctuated by moment of particular intensity by certain events that have more impact. But it, there has been a game in which I I did capture Moscow and Sevastopol. And I still did very poorly because I spent too many resources, too many things on that, on those really cool events. So you're going to have more complexity than Gettysburg or Waterloo Solitaire or other similar tactical games. But you still have complexity within what is very low complexity compared to other war games. This is definitely a, an excellent war game for beginners because it gives you the feel, the flow, the decisions. Yes, the element of randomness. Get used to that, you're a gaming friend. Uh, that you have in war gaming a, such a fraction of complexity of so many other bigger war games. And it, you have a game that you can play solitaire very easily anywhere. It's already set up. You could also play cooperative. I don't see why not. You could have multiple people deciding together what to do, deciding how to uh, make decisions and to invest those resource points. And just the flow and the narrative is just interesting. It's just fascinating that you see history come alive with such a minimal overhead of rules, of set of times, and of gameplay. In half an hour, you're going to be able to replay Barbarossa. And in an hour or two, you can see different variants. So one's pushing more one way, one pushing more in the other direction, one's another one trying to have a balanced attack. And it's always interesting. Every time I played it, there were just things that happened that I did not expect. Now, one element of randomness is you may become complacent about the, the side theaters, the other theaters, 
well, no one is there, so I'm just going to go and push towards, uh, you know, my main objectives in Russia. And then the last couple of turns, uh, those British people start sending people to North Africa and the Middle East, and, and then you don't have enough actions to, to make up for that, and you lose points. Is that excessive randomness? Well, no, because you could have mitigated that. In Bismarck, I felt it from time to time, well, you, you just attack an enemy out of nowhere last turn, and again, as I argued in, in that review, that's part of the theme, you can accept that. But this game even have a better game type of, of remedy to that, meaning you can choose to accept that element of luck by ignoring those theaters and by always being sort of like one behind. I wait for them to send somebody, then I send somebody, I wait for them to send somebody there, then I match their number, but then you are still, well, leaving yourself open to possible reversals of fortune if at the end, indeed, they start sending a lot of people there. And so a wiser way, a more balanced approach is try to complete your objectives and from time to time spend an action to send somebody to those theaters, which may or may not become active, but chances are they will to an extent. So you really have a nice element there in which you can decide how much you want to push and how much you want to kind of like disperse your forces or just push entirely, but then have to deal with the possibility of some late reinforcements that the enemy sends to those other theaters. There are just so many things you have to take into account in a game that is so simple in which you just commit one to four resource points. Um, and even when you know you have one resource point and maybe you spend it to riff it, you have one resource point and you spend it just to build a reserve. So it feels anticlimactic, but it's one turn in 20 and the opponent is very quick. And so you don't feel like, oh my gosh, I basically skip my turn, I go through a lot of upkeep, then I have another short turn, a lot of upkeep. And that's something that you have to take into account a lot of Soiter games, the balance between upkeep and taking actions. Here, even when your turns are short because you have one action, one resource point, the upkeep is also very fast, so I never felt that, that there was an imbalance there. So on to Moscow, I have to tell you, I love this game. This is one of the best war games I played recently. It feels like a legit war game. It feels like a bigger, more complicated war game, which nevertheless I can play in a very short amount of time, has very simple rules. The emphasis is on gameplay and decision. And it's just fun and exciting. So what else can I ask for from a war game? On to Moscow Solitaire. I'm really, really happy with this one.